In this video, we are going to be debunking Gavin Ortland in his five-minute case for Protestantism. As we're going to see, he tries to make a case for Protestantism, but it does not hold up. He has many misconceptions about the Catholic Church and about history. So in this video, we are going to be playing the clips from that video and showing what he says and then commenting on them right after this. Hello everyone and welcome to Catholic Truth, where we teach and preach the truth that has come down from the apostles and Jesus over 2,000 years. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, live your faith, and be passionate and set on fire for it, and even be able to defend it. If you would like to check out our description show notes below, follow us on social media, support us on Patreon or PayPal or anything else, check it out down below. So, in this video, we are going to be debunking Gavin and his five-minute case for Protestantism. Let's see what he has to say. Protestantism is a branch of Christianity that traces its origins back to the 16th century Reformation in the Western Church. There are different Protestant traditions, but they share foundational commitments like the five solas, two sacraments, the priesthood of all believers, and many other doctrines. So... I have to stop it right off the bat here because there's a couple things he says that just aren't true. First, he says rightly that Protestants were started in the 16th century. Jesus started his church 2,000 years ago, not in the 16th century. So that tells me already that Protestantism is not true. Any more than Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, or any of the other religions that came many centuries way too late. He also says that Protestants agree on the essentials, like things like the five solas and two sacraments, which is erroneous, by the way. This isn't even true. They do not agree on the essentials, even right down to the basics of what the word faith means, justification, the role of works, baptismal regeneration, and many other things. And in fact, he says two sacraments, but he, he doesn't seem to know, or maybe he's just ignoring the fact that some Protestant religions have more than two sacraments. Others don't have any sacraments at all, and they say we don't need sacraments. And so I, don't, I would honestly like to know whether he's ignorant of this or whether he's just ignoring the fact. Like Lutherans, for example, the original Protestant religion that's supposed to have got the church back on track when the Catholic Church brought it astray. It was Martin Luther that God used to get it back on track. But if that's the case, then why isn't everybody Lutheran? If Luther got it right and God used Luther to correct the errors, then why isn't everybody Lutheran? Lutherans have, for example, the sacrament of confirmation. They also believe in baptismal regeneration infant baptism, and other things that I'm sure Gavin does not accept himself. So you cannot possibly say that all Protestants agree on the basics because they don't. Now at this point, people might say, yeah, but Luther got a lot right, but he still got things wrong. Okay, so God used Luther to correct the errors of Catholicism, but he didn't really correct all the errors of Catholicism because he still got things wrong. Uh, yeah, 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 and then people needed to correct him. Okay, did they get everything right? Like Calvin? Oh, no, no. Calvin got some stuff wrong, too. What about Zwingli? Oh, no. No, we're not part of that religion, either. Well, who's right, then? Oh, we are. We got it right, finally. No, it's just us. Just our little individual institution or sect or denomination or whatever you call it. No, this is Protestantism in a nutshell. From day one, they argued with each other about the basics of theology, doctrine, how to be saved, and other things, as we're going to see in one minute. Protestantism is more Catholic. The word Catholic just refers to the entirety of the church. The major non-Protestant traditions, like Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, the Assyrian Church of the East, all claim to be the one true church. Throughout the medieval era, pretty much all the Roman Catholics think that the non-Catholics are damned. Pretty much all the Eastern Orthodox think that the non-Orthodox are damned, and so forth. And those views find their way into the highest levels of magisterial teaching. By contrast, Protestantism doesn't restrict the church to one institution. I'm just going to stop it here, even though I want you to hear more of what he has to say. But don't you find it interesting that he says that Protestantism is more Catholic? Does that sound like an oxymoron to anybody? A contradiction? I mean, by definition, Catholic is Catholic. 
and Protestant is Protestant. I mean, it doesn't seem to make sense. I know he's probably going back to the belief of restorationism where, you know, Protestants restored the true gospel of Jesus Christ that the Catholic Church perverted and they finally got it right. But again, it comes back to which Protestant? They don't agree. Is it Lutherans or is it Calvinists? We'll come back to this in a second. But the restorationists are all over from the Church of God in the 19th century. They believe God used them to restore the true gospel. Mormons believe God used them. Jehovah's Witnesses believe God used them. The Seventh-day Adventists believe God used them. Protestants of various denominations believe God used them. And down the line, they all believe that God used them to restore the true gospel, but they all disagree on what that actually means. Second, he commits the elementary mistake of calling Catholics Roman Catholics, or the Catholic Church the Roman Catholic Church, when in fact Roman only refers to one right within the church. There are 23 rights, R-I-T-E-S, in the church. There are Syrian Catholics, Byzantine Catholics, Maronite Catholics, and others all under the universal church. That's what the word Catholic means. It means universal, not Roman. So it's not the Roman Catholic Church, Gavin. It's the Catholic Church. And this Catholic Church has 23 rites all under the Pope for 2,000 years and goes back 2,000 years. So it's just the Catholic Church. That's why if you look at our catechism, it says the catechism of the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. Third, he says that the Catholic Church condemned everyone who wasn't Catholic in the Middle Ages, the medieval era, and the Orthodox did the same thing. But he doesn't seem to understand that the Orthodox didn't exist for the majority of the medieval era, the Middle Ages. I mean, different people have a different understanding of when it started, but generally around 476 people think the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the medieval era started. and. 476. And the Orthodox didn't come into existence or break away from the Catholic Church until 1100, almost the year 1100. So we're talking like almost six centuries. So he just makes it seem like, oh, it's been this way throughout the whole Middle Ages, but it's actually not that way. And yes, of course the Catholic Church condemns anyone who's not Catholic. So did Jesus. Jesus had a set of doctrines, and if people didn't follow it, they were condemned. He said the road was narrow, but the road to destruction is wide. You follow him, you go to heaven. You don't, you won't. <laughs> and so the same thing down with Christianity as well. You see Paul, you see the apostles, they were very exclusive to the doctrine that Jesus taught, they clinged to, they held to. And if anyone departed from that truth, they were not part of the church, which is the body of Christ, which is the bride of Christ. Christ only has one body, not thousands. He only has one bride, not thousands. And so if you depart from that and you start making up other doctrines which diverge from what Christ actually taught, then you are in sense leaving his church and starting something that is different, different than what he started. Do you think Christ would condemn that? Of course he would. Christ wants us to believe in everything he taught, not in things he didn't teach, man-made traditions and doctrines. Things like the Bible alone, faith alone, the rapture, private interpretation of scripture, and countless other things that Protestants have invented since. And if you think of it organically, it makes sense. Like, if the church is like an ark, and it's a huge ocean liner that Jesus started, and everybody's on it, and it's safe, and it has leaders, people who run the ship, and even though they can become corrupt sometimes, and they do things that are evil that they will have to account for in Judgment Day, Jesus himself guides the ship to the other side. Now, let's say that some people don't like the way things are going, and so they jump off into a life raft and start trying to sail toward heaven, toward the other shores themselves. Are they going in that direction? Maybe. Is it going to be more difficult, especially when great storms come? Absolutely, because the church that Jesus started is the easiest and straightest path to heaven. And that is the Catholic Church that he started. Now, the earliest Christians saw the church like an ark too, and if anyone left the ark, they were lost. I mean, you couldn't be saved if you left the true church that Jesus started, if you left his doctrine, if you left his teachings, if you left the true gospel. How could you be saved? So this isn't just a Catholic thing. It's not just an Orthodox thing. It's a Christian thing from the very earliest days of Christianity. Don't believe me? Go back and read the earliest Christians from the earliest centuries and you will see that if you were not part of the church and you didn't have the bishops and the priests and the deacons that Christ gave us, then you weren't part of the church and you couldn't be saved. In the 19th century, the historian Philip Schaff argued for a vision of Protestantism as an organic renewal effort within the one true church. 
He called Protestantism the principle of movement, of progress in the history of the church, and spoke of its Catholic union with the past, insisting that the Protestant traditions have fundamental points of continuity with traditions outside Protestantism. I appreciate Gavin's effort here, and his video is well made with all the little cartoons and drawings and stuff, but in reality, it's just not true. In some parts, it's very hard to even take seriously, like this part here, where he uses one man in the 1800s who's trying to concoct a whole theory of which Gavin's saying, oh, well, this is what it is, because this man tried to argue for this case of what Protestantism could be. But if he had to argue for the case then that means the case wasn't made. It means that Protestants don't actually believe this. It means there was no organic whole understanding of this across the board because he has to argue for it. So the case that he's making this is what Protestantism is is not actually what Protestantism is because Protestants don't accept it, which is why some Protestants are trying to argue for it. Understand? <laughs> At best, it's what some Protestants believe, which kind of refutes the point he's trying to make. And as we hinted at in the earlier sections, from day one, the earliest Protestant reformers, who he tries to say, oh, they just agreed on everything, or even the essentials. No, from day one, they bickered and argued fiercely and condemned each other fiercely. He says, oh, the Catholic Church condemned anyone who wasn't them. Well, so did the Protestant reformers. What exactly did they condemn other people on and for? Well, think about it. It was over doctrine. If you did not agree with my doctrine, if you didn't agree, say, with Luther's doctrine, you were on the outside. You were the Antichrist. You weren't even a Christian. And you should see the harsh way that he talked to Zwingli, to the Anabaptists, and to others who didn't agree with him. Same thing with John Calvin. John Calvin went further than just really not liking people and condemning people who disagreed with him. He had them killed oftentimes because they were heretical and outside of the true faith. Which is the true faith? His faith, his doctrine, his teachings, which disagreed with Luther's and which disagreed with uh, Wesley's and Zwingli's and many others as well. They all disagreed with each other. And even when they tried to come together in a Protestant council and create a Protestant creed, they couldn't agree. And they left sh not even shaking hands. They left angry with each other. I'm going to do a whole topic on this. I'm going to do a whole topic just on Zwingli and Luther and themselves and how they called each other the Antichrist. Like, if you don't believe in baptismal regeneration, you were the Antichrist, according to Luther. If you, were, if you didn't want to baptize infants or if you didn't accept or, or if you thought the Lord's Supper was only symbolic, which many Protestants today believe, you were the Antichrist. You weren't even part of Christ's church. You were hellbound. Like, they had the strongest condemnations for people who did not agree with them. So this false analogy, this false dichotomy that, that Gavin's trying to create, that Protestantism had this unity and accepted people who were different than them in other denominations. And yes, there is a wishy-washiness, a moral relativism to Protestantism today. Yeah, well, we just agree in Jesus. You know, we all believe in Jesus. So, you know what? It, it, the differences don't matter. We're, we're all brothers and sisters. Yeah, that's liberal relativism. You know, that's not Christ-like. That's not Christianity. That's what moral relativism is in the world. Secular people believe that. You know what? You have your truth. We all have our truths. But you know what? We agree on many things. We can't say that, oh, they're wrong on this or they're wrong on that because you know what? We agree on many of the essentials. Protestantism kind of led to the secular moral relativism that we have today. We all believe in Jesus. Yes, we all do believe in Jesus. But some believe in baptismal regeneration as being necessary for salvation and others don't. If it is necessary for salvation, then the better tell the people on the outside that they're not saved and other things like that like what is faith the role of works and many other things he calls it the principle of movement and of progress in the church doesn't that sound strangely like Mormonism to you? <laughs> they talk about progressive doctrine, progressive revelation, God continuing to reveal things today. It sounds like Mormonism to me. I'm sure that's not what he's going for, but that's what it sounds like. It's constantly moving. It's constantly changing. It doesn't matter if we all disagree with each other. But the bottom line is Jesus taught one faith, one hope, one doctrine, one unity, one baptism. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible is so serious about this unity and anybody departing from the unity is it's has the harshest condemnations in scripture people are often surprised to discover that this is how the reformers thought luther said in the papacy there is true christianity even the right kind of christianity and many great and devoted saints the christendom that is now under the papacy is truly the body of christ and a member of it calvin said 
when we categorically deny to the papists the title of the church, we do not for this reason impugn the existence of churches among them. He goes on to actually try to show how Luther and Calvin were supposedly tolerant to people who are outside of them and their beliefs, which is ridiculous, as we just showed. And he's quoting Luther as, you know, oh, the Catholic Church has this and that. The Catholic Church still has Christians. The seat of the papacy is actually Christian. And all these other things from early Martin Luther in his life, not late Martin Luther in his life. I'm going to read to you a few quotes, and you let me know if you think Luther and Calvin, for example, because this could go either way, Zwingli name any of the reformers. Let me know if you think this sounds tolerant, like they just accept people who are outside of them. In his document on Christian liberty, Martin Luther says this, The Church of Rome has become the most lawless den of thieves, the most shameless of all brothels, the very kingdom of sin, death, and hell, so that not even the Antichrist, if he were to come, could devise any addition to its wickedness. Wow, that sounds like, yeah, the Catholic Church is just another Christian place. It has some Christian brothers and sisters. You know, it has some Christianity there. It doesn't sound like it has anything there, according to Luther. Listen to what else he says. Heretics are not to be disputed with, but to be condemned unheard. And while they perish by fire, the faithful ought to pursue the evil to its source and bathe their heads in the blood of the Catholic bishops and of the Pope, who is the devil in disguise. Wow, so accepting. You know, I mean, just he just loves Catholics. <laughs> no, if you actually read Luther, there is no love for the Catholic Church, the papacy. He doesn't think any of it is Christian. Yes, he could accept that there are Christians in the Catholic Church here and there, but the Catholic Church itself is not. Listen to what Lutheran pastor and theologian Jason D. Lane says. He says, Luther argued that the papacy of Rome was not church since it did not offer Christ's life-giving gospel and wanted to be the church as the supreme outward monarchy of the whole world. He goes on to quote Luther saying, We do not agree with them that they are the church. They are not the church. Nor will we listen to those things that, under the name of the church, they command or forbid. Thank God a seven-year-old child knows what the church is. So when he says that Christendom under the papacy is truly the body of Christ, it doesn't seem like they think there's anything that's part of the Christ, body of Christ in the Catholic Church. Yes, there might be people in there that are part of it. There might be good parishes or good some good people, but the Catholic Church itself is wholly corrupt. And they are condemning that. You know, the, so the fact that he says Catholics condemn anyone who's not Catholic, well, they're condemning people who aren't them as well. So that's kind of problematic. Even other Protestants they're condemning if they don't agree with them. The only way they accept other people is if they agree with them in their interpretation of Scripture. Both Calvin and Luther defended the ecclesial status of Eastern Orthodoxy against Roman Catholic claims of exclusivity. For example, Calvin said, They make the Greeks schismatics. With what right? Because in withdrawing from the apostolic see, they lost their privilege. What? Would not they who fall away from Christ deserve to lose it much more? In this section, he says that the Protestants tried to defend Eastern Orthodoxy against the claims of uh, Catholic exclusivity. Of course they did. They're both on the outside and trying to find a commonality between each other and against the Catholic Church that they both broke away from. If they could become a force, they would have more legitimacy among themselves. Is it any different than the countries of old in Europe who may not have even liked each other, but they would become allies if it meant defeating the bigger enemy on the other side, say England or France or something like that? They would often come together even though they weren't like best buds and they would try to form an alliance to overcome the real enemy. And that's all that's being done here. It doesn't mean that they're right. It doesn't mean that it's legitimate and that doesn't mean that it's true. And he goes on to quote John Calvin saying, what right does the Catholic Church have to excommunicate uh, the Eastern churches? 
um, the same authority that Christ gave them, <laughs> the same authority we use to condemn the Sabellianism in the third century, the same one we condemned the Marcionites and Simon Magus and the Arians in the fourth century, the Nestorians in the fifth century, the Monophysites, the, those heresies and all the following heresies and all heresies down through the ages, iconoclasm. I mean, literally the Catholic Church has condemned heresy from day one, from the first day of councils, we have kept pure doctrine and we condemn doctrine that's not right. So what authority do we have? The same authority that we've always had that was given by Christ to the church. Yay! Christ gave his authority to the church, so the church has this authority. It's always had the authority to excommunicate people if they don't obey legitimate authority, teach heresy, or some other serious reason. Honestly, this is just John Calvin's opinion. I mean, why should we listen to John Calvin? He killed people too, and excommunicated people too, and removed people too who disagreed with him. And then he's saying, oh, what right does the Catholic Church have to do that? Yet he's doing the same thing. Seems a little hypocritical. If you're interested, we recently made a video on the canon of scripture and why the Orthodox have more books in their Bible, Protestants have less, but how they actually tried to come together and form an alliance together and it dissipated almost immediately. They couldn't make it work. They had nothing in common. They started condemning each other. Just, it didn't work. But if you're interested more in that, you can check out our video. Compare those statements with the pre-modern ways of thinking in the non-Protestant traditions and you get two fundamentally different ways of construing Catholicity. Bottom line, if you are opposed to shrinking the church down to one institution, you should probably be a Protestant. Second reason, Protestantism has a more realistic and compelling relation to church history. Cardinal Newman famously said, to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. This is wrong on so many levels. Again, he, want, he doesn't want to shrink the church down to one institution, but it's clear that Jesus only started one church, one faith, one baptism, one hope, as we said, one doctrine, one unity. Where is the unity among Protestants or just the doctrinal unity among Protestants? It's not there. So you can't point to that as being the church. Oh, we're just invisible believers across different denominations, all believing different things. Some do baptism this way. Some do baptism that way. Some baptize them in the name of Jesus. Others baptize them in the name of the Trinity. Some do both. I mean, how can we say that it's this way or that way? Oh, we just believe in Jesus, but we do different things. No, the earliest Christian had one way, one way of doing things. The Bible has one way of doing things. We don't get to make up what we want to do based on whether we disagree with our pastor and he disagrees with us and we get in a fight and then we go start our own denomination and do it our own way till someone disagrees with us at our new parish and we tell them to get lost and hit the parking lot and they go start things their own way and we all do different things. That is not Christianity. That's heresy. That is not biblical. There's no biblical blueprint for that in the entire New Testament. It's not from God. And Protestantism, as we know, doesn't go back to God, but to this protesting in the 16th century, this anarchy, this rebellion. Now, protesting corruption, good. Creating false doctrine and heresy, that's bad. Again, he tries to glorify Protestantism as being so like above the Catholic Church and doing things properly, but from day one. I mean, look at Luther. Just read Luther's writings on the Anabaptists and what he thought about people who disagreed with him. Whoo! And the, you know, death penalty that some of the reformers wanted to give them and other things. I mean, clearly you have to ignore a lot of history to promote this view. Reformers appealed to the church fathers just as much and sometimes more than they appealed to scripture to oppose what they saw as the novel accretions and innovations of the medieval West. Things like the following seven examples. Number one, the financially abusive system of salvation involving indulgences, the treasury of merit, masses for the dead to reduce time in purgatory, and so forth. Number two, transubstantiation as the required mechanism for real presence in the Eucharist. Number three, papal infallibility. Number four, that the number of sacraments is seven. Number five, cultic practices like the veneration of icons. Number six, withholding communion in both kinds, that is, in both bread and wine from the laity. Number seven, the elaborate role assigned to Mary in the piety and dogma of the church. None of those issues has a solid basis in patristic Christianity. Now, to be clear, church history is complicated. It doesn't neatly or consistently serve as a support to any one side in the current debates. 
But Protestants can simply accept that messiness because tradition is not for us an infallible guide. In this part, he makes a lot of sweeping claims and generalizations, and he tries to appeal to the early church fathers of all people and say that they match up more closely. They align more closely with Protestants than Catholics, which is literally laughable. You literally have to ignore all the Protestant traditions that have emerged and been invented since the 16th century that do not align or match up, nor can be found anywhere in the early church. Did the early church teach the Bible alone? No, they didn't. That was invented in the 13th, 14th century with the proto-Protestants. Did the early church teach faith alone? They absolutely did not. Did they teach the private interpretation of scripture? No, they did not. Did they teach church the way Protestants understand it today, void of bishops, priests, and deacons? No, they did not. Did they teach just two sacraments? No, they did not. I mean, literally, if you go back and read the writings of the earliest Christians, you're going to see that they were Catholic, which is why uh, he said it in this video that to be steeped in history is to cease to be Protestant, which is exactly right, and which is why so many Protestants, including pastors and theologians, have all become Catholic because when they went back and re read the earliest Christians and saw how they did church, they realized that the Protestant service is nowhere found there. Their idea of the Eucharist is nowhere found there. Their understanding of many doctrines is nowhere found there, whereas the Catholic doctrines are. Not to mention all the earliest Christians claim to be Catholic, not Protestant. Protestant, and they claim to be the true church of Jesus Christ. They also talk about sacraments, transubstantiation, baptismal regeneration, intercession of the saints, Mary, and her being blessed by God. Not only did the earliest Christians talk about Mary, but Martin Luther himself, the founder of Protestantism, the one who got it straight, the one who got it back on track, also taught Mary being blessed above all women, and he taught her with high honor and praise, of course, not to obscure Jesus Christ, but he honored her highly, and I think Protestant Protestants are either ignorant of this or they totally ignore it altogether. The earliest Christians also talk about apostolic succession, passing the authority that Christ gave the apostles, the first bishops, onto other men through the laying on of hands and all of these other things that are foreign in many Protestant churches today. Go back and read the earliest Christians and you will see that they taught the Catholic Mass. Yes, they taught the Catholic Mass, not a Protestant worship service. And so everything that the earliest Christians taught was Catholic. And I challenge you to go back and read them. And we're going to have whole videos on this in the future. He said Protestants disagreed with Catholics on seven things. But why should that be proof of anything? Because they disagreed with themselves on almost everything. So to us, that's not that convincing. Luther adamantly admitted that he received the sacraments and the scriptures and many other good things from the Catholic Church. And this man, Gavin, seems to be ignoring all the innovations and inventions of Protestantism that was not found at least until the 13 or 1400s, which means it's an invention in the church. We recognize that only the words of Scripture are God-breathed, carried along by the Holy Spirit, the oracles of God. Jesus quoted the Old Testament as God speaking and warned against elevating tradition to a role that nullifies the Word of God. In this section, and then the one right before, he says that for Protestants, Scripture is the final authority. Now, the only problem for Catholics is that that's unbiblical. It's not in the Bible. It's not even taught in the Bible. Whereas if you go by the Bible and all doctrine must be found in the Bible, then the Bible as the final authority must be taught in the Bible and it's not. So that's our big problem with it. We love the Bible. We love scripture. But the Bible alone, sola scriptura, the final authority, all unbiblical. The earliest Christians did not teach that. They taught the authority of the church. They taught tradition. And we just had a debate recently on this where we gave many quotes from the early church on tradition. Just to name a few, uh, St. Hippolytus in the early church has an entire document on the tradition of the church. St. Augustine, who many Protestants would love to stamp the Protestant stamp on his head, making him a Protestant even though he's a Catholic bishop, he says this, but in regard to the observances which we carefully attend and which the whole world keeps and which derive not from scripture but from tradition, we are given to understand that they are recommended and ordained to be kept either by the apostles themselves or by councils, the authority of which is quite vital in the church. St. John Chrysostom likewise says this, Stand fast, therefore, brethren, and hold to the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by letter. 
for this is very clear that they did not hand everything down by letter. But there is much also that was not written. Like that which was written, the unwritten too is worthy of belief. So let us regard the tradition of the church also as worthy of belief. There are so many, many quotes that I could give from the early church showing they believed in the Bible and tradition, uh, something many Protestants reject. And not all Protestants, because some Protestants accept some traditions, whereas others say, no, you don't need any tradition at all. And they don't realize that they're going by traditions themselves. He says that only the words of Scripture are God-breathed, inspired. Really? Because the Bible doesn't actually say that. Protestants read in their own theology to the Bible. Yes, it says that the scriptures are inspired and God-breathed, but it never says that only the scriptures are God-breathed. It never says that. And in fact, the Jews had a different understanding for the word God-breathed, and they did not only use that for scripture, but for normal books as well. We'll talk about that more in a future video. Then the scriptures he gives to try to prove this actually disprove what he says. He quotes 2 Peter 1.21, which says that scripture is carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is a lesson for all Catholics. If someone quotes, anti-Catholics quote scripture to you, look up the quotes because most times they are wrong or taken out of context or used with their own personal theology added to it just like this. It says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't say scripture was carried by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say that at all. It says prophecy never came by the will of men, but by God, which we agree with. But he's assuming that prophecy is all written down and that not all of it was oral. In fact, it was oral long before some of it was written down. He can't possibly believe that it's only written down. Prophecy even continues in the church today. And God speaks to people through prophecy today, and it's not written down. Notice the verse says that the prophecy came by the will of God, but the holy men of God spoke as they were moved. Notice it says spoke. It doesn't say written. Notice it doesn't say God guided all the people to write it all down and it was carried by scripture because it was all written. No, it says he spoke it. Spoken, meaning not written, meaning oral, meaning literally the opposite of what he's trying to teach here. I mean, seriously, how confused can we be? This backs up what Catholics have always taught, which is found in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And it says this, For this reason, we give thanks without ceasing, because you received the what? The word of God, which you have what? Heard from us. And you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it truly is the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So the word of God was passed down through hearing through preaching, through Paul. It wasn't just written. Some people say, oh, all the word of God is just written. No, it's not. It's also preached, which is the, the common fallacy and the fatal flaw of this argument here. Scripture says that the word of God is in oral form and written form. Yay. Lastly, he quotes Romans 3, 2, which says that scripture is the oracle of God. Now, to me, this is amazing. This is fantastical that he could actually read this into the scriptures. Seriously, if you look up the word oracle in the dictionary, and there's different definitions, but it says that an oracle is a response or a me message given by an oracle. It also defines it as a person through whom a deity is believed to speak. So the prophets of old were oracles because God spoke to them and they spoke to others. That's why God said, take this message and go preach to the Israelites. Go warn the house of Israel. Go tell this person. So God spoke to them, and they spoke the word of God to others. They didn't write it down and say, here's the note from God. Here, this is scripture. No, they spoke it. The fact that Gavin is saying that the word of God is only, or oracles of God are only written, is nonsense. It's just not true. I don't know how he can come up with this teaching when we know that for the majority of all history, the word of God was always spoken in revelation, was given through people to other people, and it was not written. Yes, maybe it was written down at other times, at later dates also, but this does not prove sola scriptura. At best, it proves what Catholics teach, scripture and tradition, oral and written. Not to mention that he's 
just taking all of this out of context in the first place. You can't just take two or three words out of a passage, out of a whole sentence, or out of a whole paragraph and say, oh, this is what it means. It doesn't work that way, and it's very dangerous, and you come up with meanings of Scripture that Scripture itself does not have. He's talking about how the Jews were given the oracles of God, meaning God spoke to the Jews. He taught the Jews, and they were entrusted with his truths that he spoke to them and that they spoke to others, some of which they also wrote down. But this is the farthest thing from proving sola scriptura. Anybody who knows the Jewish religion knows that they believed in tradition, scripture, and the teaching authority of Moses, which is exactly what the Catholic Church believes today. Scripture, tradition, and the teaching authority of the magisterium of the church that Christ gave his church. This is also why 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, Hold fast to the traditions, whether written down or by word of mouth. Both. It doesn't say hold one, but the other is good too. No, it says has them both on equal footing. It says hold to both. Did you notice that he said Jesus quoted the Old Testament as some proof for sola scriptura? Guess what? Catholics quote the Old Testament as well. Yay, we do quote the Old Testament, but that does not mean we believe in the Bible alone, and it does not mean that Jesus taught the Bible alone either. So while he tries to condemn bad traditions, which the Catholic Church condemns also, Jesus and the Bible upholds good traditions and tells us to keep them. I mean, is there any blueprint for sola scriptura in the Bible? Do we see people reading in the New Testament the books for themselves or pamphlets for themselves, trying to figure out what it means, interpreting it for themselves, disagreeing with each other, telling this person they're wrong? No, we see the church, a teaching and preaching church operating and teaching the truth, not people just sitting around trying to figure it out for themselves. That is Protestantism, but it's not Christianity. There wasn't even a Bible for 400 years, so how could we go by the Bible alone? And for most people, for most of history, couldn't even read at all. So Jesus would not and could not have started a Bible-only religion. It would have been a terrible idea to start a religion based on reading when most people couldn't read. To sum up, Protestantism is, first, a renewal within the church. Whoa, 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 whoa. Again, okay, again. How can Protestantism be a renewal within the church? How? Which Protestantism are you talking about? Are you talking about Lutheran? If so, you should all be Lutheran. Okay, let's say that Luther renewed the church and he corrected the church. Then you should be Lutheran. But if he didn't get it all right, then it still needs to be reformed. Then who got it right? And who's the final version who got it right? You can't say Protestantism renewed the church because then you have to say, well, okay, which Protestantism? Which, which Protestantism is correct? Is it Lutherans or Calvinists or Zwingli or Anabaptists or Methodists or Pentecostals or Baptists? I mean, they severely disagree with each other on many things. Again, the early Protestants believed in infant baptism. Many Protestants today still do and many don't. So who's right? They're both Protestants. They're both using the word of God, scripture, and they're both disagreeing with each other on basic core doctrines. And again, Mormons claim to be a renewal of Christianity, claim to fix what Protestants couldn't even get correct. Jehovah's Witnesses, Church of God, they all claim the same thing. So just because you claim something doesn't mean it's true. A removal of historical accretions, and third, a return to the authority of Scripture. Again, it's funny that he's talking about novelties being created in the church, and yet he believes in the Bible alone, which is one of the biggest novelties ever created in history history. And in fact, as we showed already, the early church believed in both the Bible and tradition. I could read many, many more quotes. But many Protestants misunderstand exactly what tradition is. Even if you accept the Bible as an authority, which Catholics do, and it's one of the highest authorities, the Catholic Church teaches that we venerate the scriptures as we do the body and blood of Christ, meaning to the highest. Yet, the Bible is not self-interpreting. It can't interpret itself. It doesn't speak to you. It doesn't teach you how to do that. It doesn't jump off the page and say, hey, you know, you should interpret the Bible passage this way. That's why one early uh, Protestant writer said that we went from having like one understanding of this is my body over the centuries to literally over 200 different understandings of Protestants of what that one sentence means. This is my body. 200 different definitions and theological understandings of it. And you're going to say that we all just agree? Either these Protestant religions are 
really confused or the Holy Spirit who guides the church is really confused because you're saying, oh, well, I pray to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's guiding me, but I come up with this. But another Protestant saying, no, I pray to the Holy Spirit. Those people are not spirit-filled. I am. So you need to listen to me. And someone else says, oh, no, neither of those people are spirit-filled. They don't divide the scriptures properly. They need to really get in touch with the Spirit. So just listen to me. Literally, this has been the nutshell of Protestantism from the beginning. And this is not to make fun of Protestantism. This is not to make uh, put Protestantism down or hate Protestants. No, not at all. It's just showing the fundamental flaws of certain doctrines of Protestantism, like the Bible alone, that does not hold up. And it's led to countless tens of thousands of denominations that have been bickering for over 500 years and can't get it right. And you would think that if Jesus left us a Bible and the Holy Spirit, you would be able to get it right. It's kind of like the United States leaving us a constitution and giving a copy to every person and say, all of you guys, try to figure it out. Really study the history of America and you come to your own conclusions on what you think it means. Do you think that would be chaos? It absolutely would be. And so has been Protestantism for 500 years. It's been chaos. And that's why there's so many tens of thousands of denominations, non-denominations, people who say that we only need to follow Paul, people who reject all of Paul's writings altogether. They all, you know, some Protestants will say, oh, well, they're not Christians. Well, that's what exactly what they say about you. And that's the problem is that the Bible can't be the final authority because how do you figure out the problem. How do you solve the problem using the Bible alone? You all just disagree using the same authority. And that's why Jesus established a church, a teaching and preaching authoritative church, just like we have government in the U.S. But he started a church which interprets scripture properly. It's not that the church is over scripture. It's just that we have the authority to interpret scripture. I actually have a lot more to say, but I have gone long-winded. This is a little five-minute video we made, and I have made a really long video answering so many of his errors and misunderstandings, and there's more that I actually had, but I cut it short for the sake of brevity, and I thank you for watching this far, and I ask you to share this. Get it out there. Share it with the world. Help people to see the lies that are being spread about Catholicism and some of the misunderstandings about the Bible and history that are out there. Also, if you are new here, welcome. Please like and subscribe to our channel so you can get these videos when they come out. We have a lot of videos like this. And uh, most of all, if you would like to support our ministry and help us to do what we do, help us to grow, continue to hire more people, and reach more millions of people for Christ, please see our Patreon and our PayPal below and follow us on social media daily for daily inspiration. God bless you.